Hello and welcome to AP Chemistry video number two, Electron Arrangement. Here we go. So, first thing we need to remember about electrons is they're arranged around the atom in a series of levels, sublevels, and orbitals. And within those orbitals, you can hold up the two electrons, right? Levels are often called shells, so you'll hear me call them shells and then subshells and then orbitals. Energy levels are uh, denoted by the, the letter N, um, and you can go up to 7. 1 through 7 are the energy levels. As N increases, you find higher energy electrons. What that means is they have more of themselves energy, and if you give them uh, the, the, the higher energy or a higher level they are, they require less and less energy to be ejected, which makes sense. Um, you all also have larger, more complex orbitals, a greater distance from the nucleus, and the levels hold an increasing number of electrons. Four types of sublevels apply. Um, you have S sublevels, which contain one orbital. And remember, one orbital is two electrons. Those are spherical in shape. You have P subshell orbitals, three orbitals in a P subshell, six up, up to six electrons in a dumbbell shape. Uh, the D subshell, you have five orbitals, ten possible electrons, and a clover shape for most of them. Not all of them, that's for sure. So let's put a most here. And then for F subshell year, there are seven of them holding up to 14 electrons, and they're daisy shaped. Again, we have some shapes we'll look at before the slide shows over. Um, quantum numbers, you notice the, sh the screen turned gray. This, this tells us that the quantum numbers are not part of the AP exam, but it's something that's really important for chemistry just because it was a kind of a grounding piece of uh, the, the quantum model. So um, it tells us the address of an electron. Like we can we can identify a particular electron with a set of four numbers. And so let's talk about how we build that. First is called the principal quantum number. Um, and we give the letter N. And that should reflect back on energy levels, right? One through seven. So um, the principal quantum number can be one through seven. Okay, it just tells you the energy level of that particular electron. The second quantum number is the azimuthal quantum number uh, given by the letter L. Okay. Um, this is, tells us what sublevel we're dealing with. And so the shape of the atomic orbital S, P, D, or F is that sublevel. So you know the energy level and the sublevel. Um, the values we give to letter L are important. They are 0 up to N, or the energy level, minus 1. Now obviously there's only four possible subshells, so it's really 0 through 3. Um, we don't have any G subshells we've identified yet in any actual atoms. So... Um, uh, also known as the angular momentum quantum number, but azimuthal quantum number will do for this course. Um, the possibilities again, 0 through 3. S is 0, P is 1, D is 2, F is 3. The third, oh sorry, let's talk about those shapes actually. These, spherical is spherical, right? So the S subshell, there's the one spherical possible orbital. The P subshell, you get these uh, dumbbell shaped orbitals, and there's three of them. D subshell, you're Mostly clover, but here's our not clover. Looks like a, a double-headed pacifier. Um, then you have the F subshell orbitals, which are, some of them are daisy-shaped. Then you have these strange pacifier-looking things in three, in three planes in the F subshell. The magnetic quantum number is the third quantum number, um, and it goes from negative L to L. Its symbol is M sub L. So, so far we have N, we have L, and we have M sub L. And M sub L, the magnetic quantum number, uh, tells us the orientation of the orbital in space, and so basically which orbital it's in. So if our L value is 2, our magnetic quantum numbers could be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. Um, and so these identify each of our orbitals, all right? So this is, if, uh, if the uh, uh, azimuthal quantum number was two, that means that this is a D subshell, right? Well, there's your five orbitals identified by two, sorry, one, zero, negative one, negative two. It's just a number, okay? It's a spot in space. The final one is your spin quantum number, M sub S. And the spin quantum number can only be one of two things, neg uh, positive or negative one-half. tells the direction of electron spin. Why one-half? Uh, the value was demonstrated experimentally, and that's as far as we're going to go with it. Here's a graphic showing the north and south spins for M sub S. And here's a question. 
one of the outermost electrons in a strontium atom. Ooh, that one word. Strontium atom is in the ground state can be described by which of the following sets of four quantum numbers? Strontium, if you recall, ends in 5s2, okay? Fifth energy level, s subshell. Remember, if it's s, we have fifth energy level. If it's s, our azimuthal number is zero, okay? So that rules out these three. And then we have to think about, well, if s, if, if, if l is zero, then m sub l can only be what? Zero. Only one possibility. So then that leaves us to whatever our spin might be. Is our best answer. Which of the following sets of quantum numbers in L, M sub L, M sub S, best describes the valence electron of highest energy in a ground state gallium atom? Atomic number 31. Well, keep in mind gallium's outermost electron is 4p1. So 4 is our quantum number uh, energy level. Then our, our as a muffle number, is going to be the p sub shell. So that's going to be 1. Remember, 0 is s, 1 is p. And so our uh, our um, magnetic magnetic quantum number is going to be negative one zero four one, okay? So that rules out all but a. Orbital shapes and energies. Orbitals have regions of high electron probability and regions of zero electron probability. When we say a p subshell is dumbbell shape, that's a, a place where there's a 90% probability of finding an electron that's supposed to be in that space. Areas where they are not in that space are called nodes. Okay? These are described by the Schrodinger model and the discoveries within the quantum model. Um, a couple ter term we need to understand is degenerate orbitals. It just says orbitals that are equal in energy. So all three 2p orbitals are degenerate. So essentially, orbitals in the same sublevel are degenerate orbitals. The Pauli exclusion principle says that in a given atom, no two electrons can have the same set of four quantum numbers. We learned that earlier in introductory chemistry, basically because two electrons in the same orbital have to have opposite spins. Well, same thing is proven with this statement, that oh, two electrons cannot have the same spot in space. The Aufbau principle, which is basically filling in German, Aufbau principle, and this is not a mnemonic, which is nice, Electrons have uh, enter orbitals of lowest energy first. So whether there's a position of lower energy around an atom, that's where the electrons are going to prefer to go. They will, uh, they will um, release energy to get there also. In its ground state, atoms have electrons in the lowest energy orbitals only. And here's your filling order, if you remember this. And keep, after, keep in mind, once you get to the D subshell, they drop by 1, and then the F subshell by 2. And... Um, Typically, we, when we write electron configurations and orbital notations, we write them in this order. Hun's rule says all orbitals in a sublevel must have half filled, must be half filled with electrons, having parallel spins before any may be completely filled. So that means if you're in a p subshell with three orbitals, you must put one electron in each of the same spin before you can pair an electron in any, in any one of those orbitals. So this is possible. This is not. So electron configuration proceeds in this order. Refer to this if you need to. A couple of exceptions we've learned before in intro chem is copper and chromium, two elements that have exceptional, exceptional electron configurations. Copper has a configuration of 4s13d10 instead of 4s23d9. Chromium is 4s13d5 and not the expected 4s23d4. Because fewer electrons are sharing orbitals, electron repulsion is decreased and stability is increased. Fewer electrons are sharing orbitals. Let's look at that. Let's look at chromium. Chromium is the 4s subshell and then the 3d subshell. You would expect the 40, 4s to fill and then to get one electron in each of the d subshells. But that's not what the data shows us. The data shows us this happens. that you put one electron in the 4s and then one electron in each of the 3d orbitals. And this is what it means by fewer electrons are sharing orbitals. So there's no shared orbitals creating additional repulsion, which destabilizes things. Okay, this is the preferred um, structure that the, the atom um, undertakes. 
These exceptions do not need to be memorized for the AP test, but given, if given exceptions, you should be able to explain them and why. I would go so far as to say if they give you any exception, be prepared to explain in terms of a reduction of repulsion. Okay? Reduction of repulsion. The probability of getting some strange configuration is a product of there being less repulsion in the atom. It makes perfect sense. Orbital notations and diagrams. I've been doing this all along, so if you have any questions, please ask. Here we go. We have electron configurations. Atom of atoms of element X have the electron configuration above. The compound that's most likely formed with magnesium is blank. If something ends with 3p3, that group must be what? We keep in mind that 3p3 is in, is in the same group as nitrogen. Then we know that it's likely to have a charge of negative 3. Okay, then if that's the case, magnesium has two plus, then we would expect a configuration of this. A through, A through E is choices. Which of these is an impossible electron configuration? What I want you to do before you guess at these is look and see which of these looks odd. Okay. Um, impossible configuration. We have a 2D here. We have a skipped 4S, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's impossible. It could be an ion. This is totally possible, it's just not written in off bow. Okay, the ground state configuration for the atoms of a transition element. The transition element are in the D block, right? So, um, ground state D block, I like E for this one. The ground state configuration of a negative ion of a halogen, a halogen that's gained electrons. Okay, so it sounds like it should have halogen, keep in mind, is group 17. If it's a negative ion or an anion, it should have gained an electron and be taken on a noble gas configuration. So I'm going to go with this guy here, B. Finally, the ground state configuration of a common ion of an alkaline earth element. And that's this guy. Where did it go? Alkaline earth metal common ion. Alkaline earth metals have a 2 plus state, which means they've got an, uh, a configuration also of a noble gas, and that leaves us only with B. So we used B twice. We never used A, and we never used, um, we never used uh, A or D. Polyelectronic atoms. What does that mean? Atoms with more than one electron. Anything beyond hydrogen. I don't like throwing a term out there we couldn't figure out on our own. Um, you could figure that out on your own, but I don't want its simplicity to throw you off. It's just what it sounds like it is. So when we use this discussion, keep in mind most of the research about the atom began with hydrogen, and a lot of assumptions were made after. So when we talk about polyelectronic atoms, we're talking about things that are very difficult to research at the atomic level as far as their electron configurations go. Next thing I want to talk about is Z-effective nuclear charge. Um, Z-effective nuclear charge is a phenomenon we observe um, in atoms uh, that dictates the behavior of uh, atoms. Okay, Keep in mind, electrons in a polyelectronic polyelectronic atom experience repulsion. They repel each other. The repulsions between electrons reduce the nuclear charge by decreasing distance, or sorry, increasing distance between protons and electrons. So when you have more repulsion, you overcome nuclear charge. The pull of the nucleus on an electron is referred to Z-effective nuclear charge. To calculate a value, a numeric value for this, which is important that we understand this power of Z-effective nuclear charge on an atom, is the number of protons minus the number of nonvalent electrons. Let that sink in for a minute. How many protons are in the nucleus minus the number of core electrons? Okay. And importantly, Z effective nuclear charge is a group trend. 
Coulomb's law. We've alluded to this in a couple of positions during this unit so far, but here's some formal direction to what it means. Potential energy uh, in some sort of a, an attraction is a proportionality constant times the charge of two bodies in space divided by the radius or the space between them. Okay. The, the K value is, the, is a constant uh, called Coulomb's constant that takes us from being a proportionality to being an equality. Um, note that we're talking about potential energy here in chemistry. In physics, you'll see a different version where it's force and the radius is squared. Uh, the rest of the ideas are the same. Keep in mind that one of these charges is positive and one is negative. We're going to talk about charge magnitude, okay? And so that's going to be important. We can influence charge magnitude. The higher charge magnitude you have, more potential energy potentially you have in your relationship. The, the larger your radius is, the bigger the distance, the less attraction there is. The potential energy changes. So those are the factors that influence potential energy um, in a relationship or a bond. Note this is not on the AP exam directly, but the concept is critical to your success, so we're treating it as if it is. The closer two oppositely charged particles are, the lower the potential energy is between them. Okay? In other words, they released energy to attain this state. Think, the energy release when they come together is large. Like charged particles, like two positives or two negative, have a positive potential energy, which is essentially repulsion. This value that we calculate is equal to, but opposite in sign to the ionization energy of an electron with these properties around an atom. Okay? So this value that we're the potential energy we find is equal to but opposite to in sign the ionization energy of the electron within these properties. We have to input energy. Okay, so ionization energy is energy input. It's a positive value. So if something's tightly held, you have a, a fairly large negative um, potential energy. Negative because if you have plus times a minus, it's going to give you a negative value. So, an electron close to the nucleus has a large force of attraction to the nucleus. It requires a large amount of energy input to ionize and has a low or very negative potential energy. An electron far from the nucleus has a small force of attraction to the nucleus and requires less energy to be ionized and has a larger or less negative potential energy. Shielding. This is the final thing we're going to talk about before we get into trends. Shielding is the effect by which other electrons screen or shield given electron from some of the nuclear charge. Generally, this is by core electrons. Electrons in inner shells shield the electrons in higher shells quite effectively from the nuclear charge, the shielding effect. Electrons in the same shell are much less effective at shielding each other. Now, saying all these shielding, shielding, shielding is important to note that when we discuss this phenomenon, we discuss it as repulsion. Okay, it is shielding, but we need to focus on the forces at play. What forces are influencing the behavior of the electrons around an atom? And in this case, it is electron-electron repulsion. So shielding, we will discuss in the term repulsion. You shouldn't see shielding as a justification on an FRQ. Finally, we need to talk about penetration effect. It is an effect whereby a valence electron penetrates core electrons thus reducing the shielding effect and increasing the pull from the nucleus. This is completely new to you, okay? This is basically saying a 3s electron has the ability to take on positions closer to the nucleus, okay? And that that, that existence makes this pull closer to the, elect, to, the, to the nucleus than you would expect, okay? In other words, the electron is temporarily closer to the nucleus than it normally would be. So here is a graphic that shows the radial probability distribution for 3s, 3p, and 3, 3d orbitals. Okay. Um, first, we have the most probable distance to the nucleus, and this is that 90% here. There's also a small percentage of it penetrating to 2 or 1. Okay. This is 3, 2, and 1. And so if we look at the 3s electron has a small but a significant chance of being close to the nucleus, 3s is the blue. And notice it can penetrate closer than the, either the red or the green. Uh, we don't see any penetration really with the D. We just see a wide band of where it could be. The 3P has the potential to penetrate fairly close to the nucleus also, but not as close as 3S. So 
closest to the nucleus technically is 3s. But we see that a large proportion of 3d are actually closer to the nucleus than 3s or 3p. It's interesting to note that. It's just that the, the, the phenomena of the penetration effect makes that 3s electron have a, a more negative potential energy and be closer to the nucleus on average. So most penetration we see is whatever energy level of S subshell, then P, then D, then F. So it's natural. It's consistent with what, we, with what we already know. This means that S electrons have a greater probability to penetrate or come closer to the core more often than P, D, or F electrons do. Electrons fill orbitals in order of, in order of increasing energy. Keep that in mind. Because of the penetration effect, electrons fill the energy level plus one S orbitals before N, D. And this is why we see 4s precede 3d, and why we see 6s and 5s precede 4f. Okay, that explains the filling patterns of these things. And I hope that makes sense. Please review these slides if this caused trouble. It requires some immersion and some thought to make sense of penetration, but it's very important for this course. Finally, just clearing up some final terms in case people don't know, valence electrons are electrons in the outermost principal quantum number energy level of an atom. Core electrons are electrons that are inside that valence or outermost shell. Okay? That's the end of video number two. Um, please stay tuned. We'll have video number three, Trends, coming next.